Okay, so now we'll jump right into working some problems. Um, uh, we'll and, and we'll jump right into using the, the, the calculator. Uh, the only difference here between the problems that we've done in chapter five and the ones that we're gonna do in chapter six is that we're finally gonna incorporate the payment key. Now the payment key is in the same row as all the rest of the time value money keys. The payment key is also cleared. The values stored there are cleared along with all the other time value of money keys by the second future value clear time value of money uh, selection. Okay, so uh, this is just something that we've been leaving out. If there isn't a payment, this is just automatically set to zero by the calculator, that's the default. In fact, if any of these are missing, if you don't need a, say, a present value or a future value or a payment, the default is zero, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so we're not gonna change anything really in terms of solving things. Once we have a payment, we enter the payment and then we compute still whatever we wanna compute. Uh, and we can see that here with this first problem. This says, what will your monthly payment be for a car you purchase for $43,500, with if the bank will finance it for you for 48 months at 5.5%, okay? Now, just like problems that ask you to solve for N or IY, payment problems are pretty straightforward in terms of what we're looking for because they're gonna say, what is the payment? Now, once we introduce a payment though, we really have to be careful with our cash inflows and cash outflows. So you've got to make sure that you are correctly adjusting uh, your, um, uh, not adjusting, you are correctly inputting your present value, future value, and payment uh, as positive or negative, depending on whether it's a cash inflow or a cash outflow. The other thing that we gotta be careful for is that the payment is going to determine um, or, and, and, or be determined by the compounding period. So again, we have a monthly payment, but we're given, remember from the lecture here, we're given the APR. This is the APR, which is the annual percentage rate. Remember that this is given by law. That's why we have to do it this way. So we want a monthly payment. We are gonna have to convert this to a monthly rate our N has already been converted. This is four years converted into 48 months. But that's the two things that we gotta watch out for in, the, in these type of problems, cash inflows and outflows. And we've gotta make sure we're converting everything to the correct compounding period, okay? Otherwise, we solve it really similarly. Here, we're trying to solve for the payment. So that's what we don't know. Uh, in order to solve for one of the uh, inputs to the problem, we need the other inputs, all right? We can only have one unknown in, this, in the formula. Um, so we need the present value. We uh, wanna know the future value. Uh, we need the number of compounding periods, the number of payments, and the IY, all right? So when we're doing these problems, in order to make sure that we get the cash inflow and outflow correct, we have to ask ourselves what the story of the problem is. And the story of the problem is that we buy a car, but that's not the right story to solve the problem. The right story is that somebody loans us money and we have to pay it back, right? In fact, it doesn't matter what we do with the money. The bank, we don't care whether we bought a car or a painting or a lemon tree. What matters to us, what we're trying to solve for is the bank loaned me $43,000. I need to pay it back every month. How much is that payment going to be? So that's the story that tells us what the cash inflows and outflows are. If someone loans me money, that is money coming in. That is a cash inflow. So it is a positive $43,500. Now I use that to buy the car, but that's not part of the story because the story is I'm paying back this loan. Now the future value of a loan is zero because I pay the loan all the way back. So there is no future value of a loan. Now this is the default value in the calculator. So if I have a loan problem and I have a future value of zero, I don't have to enter zero future value. That's the default. It's not gonna screw anything up if you do it, but you don't need to do it. But we should be aware that it's not that this is missing, it's just that the future value in this case is zero because we pay the loan all the way off. Now the compounding period is the month, which means our N has to be in months and it was given to us in months, so that saves us some time, 48 months. 
The IY, however, was given us in an annual rate. It's always given as the APR. Uh, so the IY is going to be 5.5, but we need to convert it to a monthly rate. So we convert something that is annual to something that is monthly by dividing by 12, the number of months in the year. And we get a monthly rate of 0.4583% per month. Right? And again, I encourage you, especially if you're struggling with these problems, to write it down just like this. Write down the compounding period at the adjustment. Make sure that you find the correct compounding in the period in the problem. Then make sure that you're adjusting it so that all of these things agree with each other. Just take the little bit of extra time until you get really used to these problems. What we're going to do then is just compute the payment, right? Now we haven't done that yet, but of course we've computed everything else on the calculator. So we can pull out our trusty calculator. First thing we do, of course, is second and future value. That clears the row that has the time value of money buttons in it. Then we're going to enter in our inputs. Our present value is 43,500. That is a cash inflow, so it's a positive value. So 43,500 and then present value. Again, we don't have to enter zero for our future value. We don't, you don't check it or anything. That's, uh, it's just the default. Our N is 48 months, so 48 and then N. And then our IY, remember, we are entering it as a percentage, so 0.4583. Right? And, uh, um, and that, that's our IY. Uh, and then we compute our payment and we get negative 1,011, And because our inputs are months, this is a monthly rate. So we're gonna have to pay the bank uh, 11,000, uh, sorry, $1,011 and some change, right? Oh, I didn't even write the right number. 6487. But me not writing the right number actually leads me to my next point, which is, uh, that there is a rounding uh, issue here, okay? Uh, and the rounding issue comes from this step right here. When I converted this annual rate to a monthly rate, I rounded to 0.4583, all right? So let me clear out. 5.5 divided by 12 is 0.4583. Now, the calculator is set to round to four digits, so we don't know what that fourth digit actually is. And of course, there you know, a, a thousand digits behind it. Now, one of the things that you can use, do in this calculator to get more accurate answers um, is recognize that even though the calculator is displaying a rounded answer, it's actually storing 30 digits here, right? So it's displaying this rounded answer for me just for brevity, but it's storing all these other values. So if I were to, for instance, right, let me clear out again, start all over. 43,500 is my present value. 48 months is my in. Instead of entering, instead of doing this calculation separately and then entering 0.4583, if I do this, 5.5 divided by 12 equals, and then I just set the answer without doing anything else, I set the answer to be IY. This will allow the time value of money to store the unrounded answer, even though it's displaying the rounded one. And now when I compute my, pre my payment, I get the unrounded, unrounded adjusted answer here, which is 0.6567, which is what I originally wrote, right? Now, obviously the difference here is pretty small, right? It's a, a difference of a penny if I round to two digits, 64 or 65. Now, this is, uh, this is the way that uh, I solve the problems, like this, right? So I, the answer that I will compute if I am solving the problem and getting the answer is this one, right? It doesn't mean that you're wrong to solve it here, to put that extra step in. It does mean that you should be aware that you'll have a rounding difference. Now, on the exam, it's gonna be multiple choice. I would never have an answer that's this close together on the exam because I'm not going to, I'm not trying to trip you up. I will ne I don't do trick questions. I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to screw you over. So you're not gonna see a problem on the exam where the answers are 0 0.63, 0 0.64, 0 0.65, 0 0.66. That's just silly. They will be a big enough gap that if there's a rounding issue, you'll be close to the right answer and you'll see it and you'll remember, right? On the homework, 
you need to make sure that of course, like you've done already, that you are following the rounding instructions exactly because the homework you are inputting the answer rather than choosing uh, from the best selection. Those of you that are using the graphing calculator can take advantage of this too. Again, I don't have a graphing calculator in front of you. And again, if you're curious about what you could do in the graphing calculator, there are those uh, calculator help files and, and the As You Learn page. But uh, those of you the graphing calculator, you can enter, for instance, the, uh, the rate, you can actually just enter 5.5 divided by 12 as your rate. Uh, and that'll do the same thing, right? So you don't have to do this separately. You can enter 5.5 divided by 12 uh, if the N was four years, you could also enter four times 12 as your N, and that would give you 48 months, and the calculator accepts those uh, formula answers uh, as inputs.